In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I pulled this out. Um, this was probably my first Bible. Anybody old enough to have one of these things? I mean, it is, it is old. I mean, it's parchment, I think. Whatever. It is so old that the copyright is 1955, and this is a multiple editions, okay? I mean, I mean, this is so old, Jesus had a picture taken on the front, see? Yeah. And I'm looking, and looking here, and it's amazing. I was, I was shocked. I'm looking at it after all these years, I looked at it again, how many Northern Europeans there were in the Middle East back then. It was amazing, all the pictures. But um, anyway, anyway, when I was a kid, you know, I, I didn't really read the New Testament much. It was kind of boring, kind of girly kind of stuff. I read the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament stories. Joseph and his coat, coat of many colors, David killing Goliath. I loved all that blood and guts and gore stuff, you know, all the boy stuff that was in the Old Testament. Yeah, and of course all those Twilight zone kind of stories in the book of Daniel. You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, the mysterious handwriting on the wall, Daniel in the lion's den, all that really kind of spooky stuff. But in today's first reading from Daniel, the te- this, the, today's text on, takes on an entirely different flavor. The seventh chapter of Daniel's is regarded by the ancient scribes as the greatest chapter in all of the books that now make up the Old Testament. This watershed chapter <coughs> begins with a terrifying vision and ends with the kingdom of God. Obviously, these last chapters of Daniel are a record of a prophecy for the end times, and there are all kinds of interpretations made from them. But no matter how one interprets them or one views them, there is one truth that stands out from among all the rest. One truth that stands out that is clear and certain, that kings and nations are going to come and go, but ultimately there will only be one kingdom superseding all of them, and that all evil is going to be destroyed forever. In verse 9 in today's reading, there's a picture of God, the Heavenly Father, and in addition to him, David also sees one, quote, like a son of man who has been given authority and glory and sovereign power over all peoples and nations, and those of every language will worship him. In other words, you can pick up your Bibles You can raise it above your head and tell everybody that you meet, we win. Yeah, the seventh chapter of Daniel is a good news chapter because the future is bright and it is wonderfully comforting for we Christians. This chapter tells us that, oh, the world may deny God. The world may curse God. The world may laugh at God. The world may ignore God. The world may even be oblivious to God. But the unalterable truth is that ultimately, God is truly in charge. That that it is, as the old hymn tells us, it is our Father's world. That God made it, and that God is still in control. Oh, we may go around in circles, but God doesn't. That's right. That's right, my brothers and sisters in the faith. Maybe sometimes, sometimes we feel we can't always trust the government. Or we can't trust in science or technology or money or CNN or Fox or MSNBC. Or or sometimes maybe we can't even trust in ourselves. But we can always, always trust in God. Always because God is always in control. And isn't that comforting to know on this All Saints Sunday? You know, it kind of reminds me of that old, old story about one day a group of scientists got together and decided that humanity no longer needed God. So they picked one scientist to go and tell God to, that basically he was fired. So a man walked up to God and said, God, we decided we don't need you anymore. We are at the point where we can clone people, and we can do many miraculous things. So, thank you very much. Now, go get lost. Well, God listened very patiently. And, and after he, the man finished, he said, Okay then, what about this? Let's say we have a man-making contest. 
And the scientist agreed. He said, okay, great. Ah, but God added, now we're going to do it just like I did it back in the old days with Adam. The scientist said, sure, no problem. And he bent down and he grabbed a handful of dirt. And God looked at him and said, no, 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 no. Get your own dirt. <laughs> Today is a day that we remember those who have gone before us. But we, we only remember those who have died. But also, not only do we remember those who have died, but also we think about the future. We think about our futures. And we all, yes, we all have a future. Might be long, might be short, but we all have a future. But the question for us right now is just how are we, are we supposed to fully live into those futures? Just what are we supposed to do with those futures? It's an age-old question. Even St. Peter asked that same question. He wrote, quote, In light of Christ's return, what manner of person should we be? And then, of course, Peter, being Peter, he answered his own question. He said, well, we ought to live holy and godly lives. In other words, all of God's people, all of God's people should be busy serving God. After all, one, one of the purposes of knowing that we have a future, is that, a future that is truly certain, is that we need to be better Christians in the here and the now. I mean, if we only focus on what happens after we die, well, then we'll forget we still have a mission during this waiting time. And we are called to do better. We are called to do a better job of being good, good stewards, to do a better job with evangelism and missions, to do a better job with social justice, to try stop, trying to stop to separate our lives into the secular, you know, the everyday stuff, and the sacred. You know, the secular being where we are the ones more or less in charge of our time and our money and our opinions and our entertainment and our homes and our relationships. And then, of course, there's the sacred part, which we keep in an entirely different slot. You know, the stuff that, you know, God is in charge of. Worship and the Bible and heaven and hell and the church and prayers and all that kind of stuff. And we plot and we plan ways to set aside the sacred place for God alone. Oh, we, so we say we're honoring God, but the truth is we want to keep God in God's little place, in God's little box, if you will, so that we're left free to have the final say what goes on in the secular realm. But I got a reality check for you guys. Everything takes place on sacred ground. God has something to say about all of our living. I mean, I, I hate to tell you this, but God isn't interested in just one little slice of the pie. God wants the whole blooming thing. God is truly interested in the ways that we make our money and the way that we spend it and the politics that we hold and the wars that we fight and the problems we have to endure, the people we hurt and the people we help and the people who help or hurt us. Nothing, nothing escapes God's all-seeing eye. This planning for our eternal future means we can't leave God in church on Sunday mornings or, or in some cases, Easter and forget about God the next time we come to worship, like on Christmas Eve. Yes, the future that God has for us means it affects our daily living, our everyday living. You know, one little girl once said, after she reflected on a sermon she had just heard, she said to her mother, she said, Mom, mother, Mom, the pastor's sermon confused me. He said, God is bigger than we are, right? And the mother said, well, yes, God is bigger. And the pastor said, God, God lives in us, right? And the mother said, yes, God lives in us. Well, concluded the daughter, she said, well, if God is bigger than us and God lives in us, Shouldn't God show through us around the edges? 
Well, today, Daniel is teaching us that God is truly in control in the here and now, and that we are called to live godly lives. But again, what does that mean for the saints in the future? Well, once there was an elderly couple who died at the age of 95, and they went to heaven. And they were overwhelmed by the magnificence and the glory of heaven. They couldn't believe all the wonders they were shown. They couldn't get over what a matchless place it was. The city was bright and clean. The food was the best ever. And they could have all they wanted of anything they desired. And the old man finally turned to his wife and he said, You know, I could have been here ten years earlier if you hadn't made me eat all those bran muffins. You know, there's a story told of how when the state of Georgia brought, bought the spacious home of the late millionaire William Rockefeller on Jekyll Island, and he had a big walking safe. And when they finally opened the walking safe, they dreamed of all the great treasures they would find in there. When they finally got it open, they walked in, and they saw the great treasures. It was half a bottle of wine and a pair of false teeth. Well, my family of faith, our afterlife will never be such a letdown. It will be a place of wondrous beauty. When Thomas Edison, when it said that Thomas Edison, when he was laid dying, he was he could hardly speak. His doctor, who was also a friend of the family, saw that Edison was trying to say something. So he bent down very close to the inventor, and he heard the inventor whisper, "It's very beautiful over here." It's very beautiful over here. I don't know, maybe the greatest thing that we can ever know for certain regarding what happens after our deaths is that we will finally be re reunited with those who have we have loved and lost for a while. We will know them even as we are known. I, I mentioned before in previous sermons that uh, in an earlier, earlier part of my life, before I became a pastor, I had the opportunity to spend some time with Tibetan Buddhists who were from the Dripurli Monastery out of India. They had come to the United States to do some fundraising. Well, one time we were talking about, talking about their faith and what happens after death, and they talked about you know, reaching nirvana, where, uh, where who they were, you know, their very essence, if you will, would be mixed up kind of in a great melange and become one with all the universe. Well, to me, that doesn't sound very fulfilling. It doesn't sound very attractive. I mean, the God that I believe loves in you and loves you and me so much that come the resurrection, the essence, the essence of who we are, it survives. Only it survives in a perfect form. Kind of a Jim 2.0, if you will. I remember standing by the deathbed of a parishioner one time, and his daughter was sitting there crying her eyes out. And I remember the man opened his eyes, and he looked at his daughter, and he said to her, Don't cry, honey. I'm ready to go. And I have saved up so many things to tell your mother. Imagine that. After having served Christ all of our lives, often imperfectly, come the resurrection, we will look upon the face of Jesus at last, and we will feel that never-ending and eternal love that he has for us. Now again, we're all going to die at some point. That is the absolute truth. The resurrection does not help us slip out of death. But what that resurrection does do is help us, to help us to see beyond death. And so on this All Saints Sunday, we celebrate the value of our God-given lives that cannot ever be obliterated by death. On this All Saints Sunday, we proclaim a creator who remains committed to his creation in spite of earthly decay and sin. On this All Saints Sunday, we learn the power of hope that overcomes despair. And, and, 
and we learn how in thanksgiving to God, we are in thanksgiving to God who assures us that through Christ, we will always have something to look forward to. That is, as long as we are truly focused on him. Amen.